fellowship of praise, we just want to invite you to stand as we prepare for worship this morning. If you are visiting with us this for the first time, we want to encourage you to fill out a visitor card. You can find those on the backs of the seats in front of you. Drop that at the Welcome Center on your way out. We have a small gift for you. And if you're joining us online this morning, we want you to fill out an info form at fopchurch.net slash info form so that we can connect with you. If you've got a testimony or a prayer request, you can also um, fill those out on either our mobile app or our website so that we can connect with you and celebrate with you and be praying with you as well. That's right. And I just wanted to give a special invitation. We are doing a marriage conference, the EXO Marriage Conference. We, this will be our third year to do it, and we've always done it in-house here at Fellowship of Praise. But... Brian Whitney Huffer here from Lifehouse, and we are actually going to partner with them. So we're going to join them at Lifehouse. So make sure you um, go online on our app and sign up for that. It's going to be February 26th and 27th. Um, all you married couples, we'd love to have you. You know what I found out today looking on social media? That today is National Quitters Day. What? Can you? I was like, really? There's a National Quitters Day out there? So I just want to say to you, if you come in this house feeling like you want to quit something, we can do all things through Christ yes. with strength, who strengthens us, right? So we are not quitters, all right? Amen. Amen. So let's just, let's just pray right now as we enter the presence of God. Lord, we know that your presence is already here in this house. We thank you, Lord, that your presence is joining us online with wherever we're located right now, wherever you're watching from. Your presence is joining us right now. And we just ask God right now that you will just come and have your way. Do whatever you want to do, God. You are welcome here today. You are welcome in our hearts. You are welcome in our lives, Lord. Use us. Choose us today, God. We want to encounter you in your precious name. Amen and amen. Worship with us this morning.
God from age to age, lift it up. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true, though the storms, though the storms may run and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart. Let's sing that again, though the storms may come, hey, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. Come on, tell your soul, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is, great is your faith. Great is. 
Come on, David reminds him so, his soul in Psalms. He says, why, soul, are you troubled? Why are you dismayed? He says, put your trust in the Lord, for I will yet praise him. Yes. He's not reminding somebody else. He's not directing it at someone else. He's directing it at himself. He's saying, there's so much going on in my mind. There's so much I'm dealing with. Soul, bless the Lord, for I will yet praise him. He is my salvation. Come on, let's reach out to the Lord of our salvation this morning. Lord, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what's, what's happening in this world, I will still bless you, God. I will still bless you. I will still praise your name. From the rising sun to the setting same. Jesus. I'll still bless you.
Brian and Whitney Huff. This is our family. This is the son of the house. We love Brian. He is now the lead pastor of Lifehouse in Beaver Creek, Ohio. So he is he's doing an outstanding job, and we're so proud of him. And we're going to get blessed by him today. Picture this. You look out your front door, and right in the road is the family cat. Your girls see this. They're crying. This is the kind of guy Brian is. He goes out with the shovel, picks it up, brings it to the backyard, digs a hole, calls out the family. They're crying. He's conducting a funeral service. All of a sudden, your cat walks by. What I'm saying is Brian is the kind of guy that will bury the neighbor's cat. But if you need anything resurrected in your life today, he is an anointed, powerful man of God. And just put your hands together right now and welcome Pastor Brian Huff. We love you, Brian. Love you, buddy. Praise the Lord. It is good to be home. If you're listening online and you're not here, I miss you. I love you. I'm sorry that you're not able to be here, but we're glad you're here listening online. But man... It's funny because it's amazing how fast the, traje the trajectory of your life can change. Like, like overnight, I'm driving to Beaver Creek instead of coming this way. I'm, I'm swiping right instead of going left. And uh, this morning, I was actually, just so y'all know, um, I was actually planning something with, with my wife. And um, I, was, I, was, I had somebody covered for Lifehouse Church, and I was planning on just... just pulling out left and coming to be in service with you guys, and uh, I just made a mention of it to Pastor Matt that I was coming, and I was actually coming in two weeks from now, and he just insisted <laughs> that I come and I preach uh, to you guys, but it's good to be home. It's good to be home. I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you uh, as much as God is doing, I think the staff over at Lifehouse get tired of me saying it the way we do it at Fellowship of Praise, the way, the way we've done it. I didn't realize how much integrity and how much love and how much influence that, that Fellowship of Praise and Pastor Matt and Miss Bobby just instilled in me until they pushed me out on my own, kicked me out of the nest. <laughs> Uh, um, but I'm telling you, God has been so faithful to us. And can we give a hand clap? Miss Bobby's here. Pastor Matt's not. But I know he'll be listening online. So, uh, yeah. So I got a lot to preach and, and uh, got a little time to speak it in. So can we jump in real fast? I want to talk to you today uh, on this. Pastor Matt is, is in the series. You guys, Fellowship of Praise is in the series of Daniel. Uh, I think it's called The Influencer. And today I'm going to jump on board and say I need an interpretation. I need an interpretation. Daniel, we're going to start reading Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. And if you don't have your paper Bible or your phone Bible, you could look up on the, one of these screens up here, I think. Are we going to have it? Daniel chapter 2. It's not working. I'll s <laughs> there we go. All right, we'll just start reading. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men explain. They can't explain it. The astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Verse number 28 right here. Throw this up so we can all see it. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be... In the day, in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Now I want you to catch this dream. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living but for our sakes who make known the interpretation, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know that the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, the great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was...
was awesome. I want you to I want you to focus. I don't know if Pastor Matt has preached on this, but just stay right here, okay? Just just build an image in your mind. And the image's head was a fine gold. It was the head of this image was beautiful gold, and its chest were arms of silver, and its belly and its thighs were bronze, and its legs of iron. And its feet, now here's where I want you to catch it, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone in this place. Thank you, God, that those joining online are able to be online with us today. Thank you for everybody that's able to be healthy enough to be here in the building with us today. God, I just pray, I just pray right now that you speak to us. I could call somebody on the phone and talk to them. But God, I pray that as a group today, as a church, as a body, I pray that you come down into this room, that you invade every heart, invade every life. Speak to us, speak to us, speak to us, speak to us, God. And we thank you for that. And dear Lord, I just want to thank you that the dab is no longer a thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right? What is that? Dance? You know, I grew up in MC Hammer days. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was dancing. What's the flaw saying? That ain't a dance. I know we don't have any students in here, but that ain't a dance. That ain't a dance. <laughs> hey, hey as, a, as a husband of a beautiful family, I've got two daughters, and my wife is right here with us uh, on the front. You guys, you guys know us, so I don't have to go through all that preliminary stuff. But uh, as a husband, I really thought, you know, my, my position as the man of the house was established. You know what I mean? Like anybody in here, you're like, I have run the roost. Any fellas, you brave enough to raise your hand? Come on, and look, he's like, I'm single. No, <laughs> like I thought, I just, you know, I, I just in my heart, in my mind, maybe in my imagination or in my dreams, I just thought, you know, Brian, you're in charge of this household. You're the man of the house. You're the one, you say it and it happens. You know what I mean? Like, and, and when it comes to parenting, my wife and I, we're on the same page. What did your mom say? That's usually my answer every time. Anybody else in here? Like, hey, can I have a, what would your mom say? What'd your mom? What'd your mom say? This is what mom says usually goes anyway. But but you know I'm kind. I was kind of comfortable in the fact that you know I I'm the man of the house. Well, one day this particular thing happened to me that just kind of put things into perspective. Uh, I, I wanted to take before we were going on an event. All four of us were going out. I wanted to take the. We have a little little four wheeler for the girls, and I have a four wheeler. And I wanted to take the little four wheeler so the girls could ride around. And mama said no. And uh, so I was like, man, I really want to take the four-wheeler, Whitney. I really want to have a little fun with my kids, Whitney. Is that so wrong? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> can, I just, can I just be a good dad and let them, you know, ride around with a four-wheeler? And it, where we were going, she, you know, didn't think we needed to take it. But my, my youngest daughter, she said to me, she said, Mama said we can't take the four-wheeler. I was like, Psh, I'm the man of the house. <laughs> I'm the man of the house, you know. So I, I just get the four-wheeler out. I get it loaded. Well, well I'm not going to tell you which one. you got a 50-50 shot at picking out which one said it. Uh, but I'm loading up the four-wheeler. I get it all into my truck, get everything locked and loaded and ready to go, you know. And I know I'm going to have to have a discussion with Whitney or I'm just going to sneak it. Anybody else do that? You know, like, I won't fight about it. I'm just going to sneak it in. Uh, so so, so I, I get it all loaded, get the door shut, and then out comes my daughter. And she comes up to me. She's like, Dad, Mom said you can't take that. I was like. So? <laughs> so what? I mean, I, hey, I'm the man of this house. I'm the one in charge. I, if I want to take the four-wheeler, I'll take the four-wheeler. I think it's kind of what I said to her. And she said, Dad, I'm telling Mom. <laughs> like, immediately I was, I, immediately, immediately I knew, like, maybe you're not as high up as you think you are. You know, it's like, <laughs> who tattletales on their mom, to their mom on their dad? You know, this, fellas, are you with me? She's like, I'm, I'm telling Mom. And she started running away. I mean, listen, I, I raise my, I pray for them every night. I go into their rooms and I speak over them. I speak love. But something hit me that night, that day. It just, it just got under my skin. I, it took me all the way back to like sixth and seventh grade. I was like, whatever you snitch, you little narc. I'm like, snitches get stitches. You know what I mean? Like, I'm the one in charge. We didn't take the four-wheeler, guys. We didn't take the four-wheeler. <laughs> But I said, I said all that to just, just get you on the same page with me. Like, who is in charge today? Who is in charge of your life? Who is in charge of your soul? Who is in charge of your family? Who is in charge of your business? Who is in charge of everything that you do? Whatsoever things you put your hands to. Who is in charge of those things? You want to answer me that? Here's what I know about heaven. 
There was one time, one time in all of history, in all of eternity, that there stood an angel that thought he could create chaos in heaven. He immediately, he didn't just get booted out in a soft landing on earth. The Bible says, I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth. There was one time in all of creation, in all of eternity, in all of history where there was, a, there was an attempt at the authority in heaven. But I want you to know something. Right now there's peace in heaven. There's calm in heaven. There's a strength in heaven. Why? Because his throne cannot be challenged. And because it cannot be challenged, there is a total peace and an understanding that no matter what goes on in the earth beneath or in the heavens above, God will always still be in charge every time. Every time. See, the chaos of life happens, and it's what's going on in our government right now. The chaos of life happens right now because there is, there's a changing of the guards, or there is a position that is up for grabs, or there's, there's a changing of, of who's, in, who's, the, who's the leader, who's the one that's in charge. But I'm telling you, regardless of who sits in the White House, regardless of who sits on every throne on this earth, there is a throne higher than any other throne. There is, listen, Daniel stands in front of a king and he sees this, this great depiction of his dream and he says it starts with gold, then it goes to, to silver, then it goes to bronze, then it goes to iron, then it goes to clay. I'm going to tell you something, that's any leadership that, in, that lasts in any of this world. The truth is, is it depreciates on its way to the foundation. But if Jesus, who is the cornerstone of the ecclesia, the cornerstone of the promise, the cornerstone of the church, if we start there with time, if we start there with value, if we start there with structure, as we grow up from the foundation, we will never be shaken. We will never be shaken. Who's, listen, God, your God, the God that sits on his throne, he does not operate out of fear. He does not operate out of anxiety. And he does not operate out of insecurity. That's why he can look at each and every one of us and tell you exactly what you need to hear because he's not afraid. He's not afraid. He's not afraid. I want to read you a scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting at verse 20. It says this. And y'all can follow along. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. He's actually casting lots, but he's already anointed. He's already anointed Saul. This is the first king of Israel. Samuel was, was told by the people, we want a king. After, they, after he was told by the people, we want a king, he inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, okay. We'll anoint them a king. And so he anointed King Saul. And he already had this conversation with Saul. And he already told him he was going to be king. But then the Bible says that he gathers all the people together to actually put him in that position. And verse number 21 says this. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. When they sought him... Listen to me here, okay? Verse number 21 at the very end. When they sought him, King Saul, the man that was to be king of Israel, could not be found. When they sought him, he could not be found. Now let's jump to verse 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, has the man come here yet? We know there's going to be a king. We know there's supposed to be an anointing. There's supposed to be a celebration. He's not here. Where is he at? So they asked the Lord. And the Lord answered, There he is, hidden among the equipment. There he is. If you read it in the King James Version, it says, There he is, hiding among the stuff. If you read it in the NIV or you read it in another version, the Amplified Version, or you go to, a, to American Standard Version, it says, there he is, hiding amongst his baggage. Hiding amongst his baggage. How many of us, as the church of God, as the ones who have the authority and the power to stand up in our nation and raise a banner to the Lord, are we hiding amongst all the stuff? How many times has the enemy looked down on you and told you, you're not good enough. Look at all the stuff in your life. 
You're not good enough. Look at all the baggage in your life. You're not good enough. Look at all the problems in your life. And so you just stay, just soaking and just just living in the mire and the muck of your history. Thank God he didn't call you because of your history. He called you because of your purpose and your future. He says, I know the plans I have for you. They are good. They're not evil. They are of hope and an expected end. That is your future. That is your future. Saul saw the fact that he couldn't. Then there comes a man after Saul. His name is David. His name is David. Saul was Saul turned evil. Saul lost his heart. Saul lost his soul and he lost the kingdom because of it. And then God went and he anointed a man named David through Samuel. Now David was the man all the way in the field. He was in the back before he ever got moved to the front. He was actually hidden. In a way, his father being asked to bring all your sons up, his father actually hid him in the background. Then you have Saul here who is afraid because he knew he couldn't. But then David, the the day that a man stands up, a giant, a Goliath, stands up real tall, David goes running into the battle. He doesn't just slide in or hide in the back. He goes running towards the battle. Because why? Saul saw that he couldn't. David saw that God could. David saw that God could. Saul was a man after man's own heart. David was a king after God's own heart. David was a king after God's own heart. Listen, Saul could hide from humanity. I'm going to tell you something in this place. You can hide in your baggage. You can hide from your stuff when it comes to hiding from humanity. But there's not one person in this building or online or under the sound of my voice that can hide from the eyes of the Lord that are constantly moving to and fro. And God does not look at your mess saying, I can't bring him out. God looks at you and says, I will establish his going. I will set an order to his footsteps. I will bring order. I need a... I need an interpretation. I need an interpretation. I need you to understand going just one more step further. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, says that he holds the keys to hell and the grave. Do you know what's crazy about this is that that Jesus himself has a key to the devil's house, that the devil doesn't even have a key to his own home. The devil devil lost all ability to go in and out and just do what he pleases. That that, that as long, listen, those hands that, that hold the future, those hands that hold the promise will never relinquish those keys. He will never relinquish those keys. Then we go a step further and we see where where Jesus actually speaks to Peter. He says, your name is Simon. I'm going to call you Peter, which means Caiaphas, which means a stone. And upon this stone I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then he says this, I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That so whatever things you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever things you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That you, you, you and I, the, king, the, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, we have the keys to heaven. Jesus has the keys to death and hell. We have the keys to heaven. Do you understand, do you understand the, the, the complexity and the authority that lies in that, that you and I can call things that are not as though they were? That you and I are more than conquerors, not because there's not a devil out there trying to kill you and there's not a devil out there trying to take you down, but every time the enemy comes in like a flood, there is a standard that God will raise up? Come on, let's put that on the news. Let's put that on the news. The church has been hiding in the baggage and hiding in the sludge and hiding in the stuff. All the while, it's time for us to come out of the sheep, out of the sheep field and get onto the battleground. Onto the battleground. Let's go to war. Let's go to war. So what? How does Satan get his power? I want you to listen real close to me today. So how does Satan have power? You're like, well, you could ask, well, he doesn't. Well, wait, wait, hold on here. He has power by abdication. That means whatever you relinquish, he acquires. 
When you put up a roadblock in your mind and you say, no devil, this is not your territory, the enemy knows by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, we're overcomers. It ain't happening. But the moment you open the door and say, well, maybe I'll listen. Maybe I'll let you in. When you abdicate yourself as a son of God and as the ones that hold the keys of heaven, then you give him authority and you give him power. When you abdicate your family, when you abdicate your house, you give him power and you give him authority that he is not designed to have. He is not designed to hold. I need an interpretation. I need an interpretation. So I'm going to tell you something that, that I need you to stay with me so you don't get offended online. Don't shut off right here. But do you know there is a place? There is a place that God's mercy and grace can't go. There is a place that God's mercy and grace cannot go. And that's into your fears. That's into your fears. Every time God calls you out, just like, just like Moses, read the Bible and read the story of Moses. God, through a burning bush, which is amazing, says to him, he says, listen, you're going to lead Egypt out. He's like, but my speech is messed up. But my speech is wrong. And so many of us were like, God is saying, go, go, go. But we lay in our fears and our imaginations of our fears. Take us to places. How many of you have stayed up late at night and thought about how you might lose your house if you lose your job? You might lose your family if you lose your... You, 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 anybody ever been there? I know the enemy, once he starts with the seed of fear, he lets that thing expand and grow and stretch and demolish your faith. And one person leaves the church. Well, the church is collapsing. No, it's not, as long as God is on his throne. But see, here's the thing about mercy and grace. Mercy and grace is for the things that you are going through or the things that you are going to go through and not the thoughts of your imagination of what in your mind you've conjured up might happen. And that's a place God can't protect you from. That's why God said this. He says, I want you to come out from among the world. I want you to get out of your brain. I want you to get out of your imagination. I want you to get out of your fear. And I want you to walk in a place called faith. Because when you step into faith, then I bring you out of imagination and I bring you into vision. I bring you out of your thoughts and your ideas and I bring you into a dream that I can stir and I can build and I can shake. And the gates of hell can't prevail. Come on, God wants the mercy and grace to surround you. So the only way he can cover you is to bring you out of your debilitating thoughts that you and the devil have made up together. Have made up together. Are you, are you following me? Is that? I need an interpretation. Number one, why am I still alive? Why am I here? Why am I here? If you're taking notes, write this down. Why are you still, why am I still alive? Elevation wrote a song, if, hey, if I'm not dead, he's not done. If I'm not dead, he's not done. And I'm going to tell you something, look in your eyes. God knows exactly what he's doing. I don't care if you're one or you're 101. As long as there is breath in you, God is saying, I want you here on the earth. And here's the issue because we have, listen, I'm going to get a little, a little political here, but I believe for the sake of all the unborn, this is okay. But you have on one side, you have on one side the pro-choicers. These are the ones that say that until that baby is born, that baby is, is not a living being. That baby is not a life. That baby is, has this, there's, it's just blood. It's just, it's part of a female's body. It's just that. But then you go back a step to the pro, the pro-lifers. Now, a pro-lifer says this, that, a, that, a, that at the moment of conception, and this is, this is very correct, but it's slightly wrong, okay? Just, just fault. Then you have the pro-lifers who say this. At the moment of conception, the, mo the moment a seed hits an egg, that baby is a living soul. And that is true. That is very true. But I want to go with you just a little bit further back, all the way back here that the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that says, before I, that's God, before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you before... <laughs> So, so, so th th listen, I'm not against the pro-life, but the truth is until we get an idea that conception is not when seed hits egg, but conception is when God says, oh, I see Brian, and he's going to do mighty things on this earth. Ah, that's conception. That's conception. 
that a living soul is a living soul before they ever breathe their first breath and beat their, her, their first heartbeat. That's a, now why am I alive? Because God didn't make any accidents. You got to go way back. Are you willing? Online, are you willing to go way back? I want to go way back. I want to go not, not to the situation I'm dealing with now, not to our political agendas that are being pushed right now, not to the pain and the hurt that I'm going through right now, but to the place where God thought about me. To the place where God thought about me. Amen. Why am I fighting so much? Point number two, and I'm going to close. Point number two, why am I fighting so much? But well, are you? Paul said this, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Do you know those are two breakdowns of two different words fight you know the first breakdown of the word fight it actually means to struggle it means to literally struggle to fight to fervently strive that's 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 the agony that's the agon agonizo may i i don't know how exactly how to say that but then there's the second word there it says fight the good fight Fight is to struggle. That's to, that's to put your hands to the plow. That's to, that's to fervently say, no, I'm not quitting. No, I'm not giving up. But then agony there, that, that second word, fight, that means to, to conflict. That means, that means to, 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 to have this moment of, of absolute contention. So what he's saying here is I want you to strive to contend. I want you to strive to contend. I'm going to tell you something, men of God in this house. I love, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. I love to go to B-dubs. Okay, that deserves hand claps just in itself. I love chicken wings and I love grease all over my face. You know what I'm saying? I love it. There's some nachos, whatever. But I love to get online. I like to watch UFC fights. Anybody in here, you want to be honest. Y'all want to be religious, whatever. But I like, hey, I like, we'll go back. We'll go back to boxing. I love Muhammad Ali. I like Mike, Mike Tyson. You know what I mean? He had an appetite for ears, but whatever. Uh, I, I mean, I go, I go, I like a fight. I like a good knockout. I'm not kidding you. I do. I like, I like to see a dude get dropped. I don't, hey, I'm not, <laughs> I've been in a few fights, been knocked out myself, okay? So I've been there. I, I don't know. It's the man in me. Maybe it's just the warrior in me. I like to see a good fight. But more importantly than that, I love to see when the men of God and the women of God come to the forefront that they're called. That's the fight that I really want to see. That's the warrior that I really want to see. That's, that, I love it when a man of God brings his, his child up to the front. They've been struggling. They've been struggling at home, and they just pray. Oh, I love seeing a man of God just laid out on his face in front of God, crying out, God, I'm strong, or God, I'm weak, but I know you're stronger. I know you're stronger. That's the fight I love. That's the fight. That's the fight I want to see. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, because shout out. Shout out to Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. I love to see a fight. I love the, the biggest, I believe it was Martin Luther, I'm going to botch it up a little bit, but I'm going to put it in my words. I love to see a fight. Martin Luther King said it like this, he said, the greatest tragedy of all humanity is when we sit silent. When we sit silent, when we sit silent, when the church... The ones with hope. You know, hope is a four-letter word to the devil. That's profanity to the enemy. He doesn't want you to have hope. He wants you to have anxiety. He wants you to have brokenness. He wants you to have depression. He wants to keep you locked in. But when the people of God, when the people of God fight. We had a young girl at our, we've been in our 21-day fast. And Friday night, actually two amazing things happened. But one of them, we had a young lady, her, her, a nine-year-old girl, parents in this place, a nine-year-old girl, a nine-year-old girl got pulled out of school because of anxiety. She had, she had uh, what's, what's the disease, that, the skin issue that she has? What is it? Say it again. Eczema. She had eczema. And because she had eczema as an, as an eight, nine-year-old girl, she got picked on, destroyed at school. And it built up this anxiety inside of her. She had so much anxiety one day at school that, that she actually lost her eyesight. She lost her ability to see. How many of you have liked that? Your soul has had so much anxiety, you've lost your ability to see. How many of you, you, you ever been to a place where all you see is right in front of you? 
and the vision that God has for you is blocked because of all the anxiety and all the fear and all the turmoil of your soul and all you see is what's going on tomorrow that you don't see what's going on a year from now. You don't, want, you don't see what's happening. She lost her vision. They actually diagnosed it as called conversion disorder. So much anxiety, so much fear that she couldn't see. We had our Friday night worship night. And I stood up and I started to talk about the woman with the issue of blood. And when I got done talking, I, I told the church, I said, she, I actually fumbled over my words. I said, this, this woman was 14 years. I said, no, she wasn't 14, it was 12. And when I said 12, it struck the heart of a woman that was standing in the back who had been battling depression. And she had it marked for 12 years. And I started to teach. And as I talked about the woman with the issue of blood, I said that, yeah, the Bible studies are good. Yeah, the sitting with Jesus is awesome. But before all of that moment happened you had to go back to a place where she, the Bible says she said inside of her heart if I could but touch his garment, I know that I can be healed. And I'm going to tell you the first step to getting close to God is to not just open up your Bible. It's to not just pray, but it's to come to a place where you understand, I need him more than I need anything else in this world. And I didn't realize it, I didn't know it, nor would it have been my intentions. But this little nine-year-old girl heard me preaching about a little woman who had been so demaciated by the, by the blood loss that she was broken. And she heard me speak this, and that little nine-year-old walked around our worship team and went to the front and just got down on her knees and started to cry, saying, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me. And her mother walked up behind her and said, what's going on, baby? She looked at her, she said, Mom... Jesus healed me tonight. Jesus healed me tonight from my anxieties. That's the God that we serve. That's the God every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Third, I'm going to close right here. Why am I in this waiting period? Exactly. Why are you in this waiting period? Why? Why are you in this waiting period? Listen, I know Isaiah. I know, the, I know what the Bible says. I know the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. He will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But I'm telling you, all of those things are action where they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All these things are action. They're motion. They're moving. So where did we get the idea that when we don't know what to do, we're just waiting? That we're just waiting. I'm going to blow your mind here. Do you know the last time in the Bible that God said to the disciples, he said, I want you to go and wait. This is the last time in the Bible. This is the last time in the Bible. If you could show me another one, show me. Where, where Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I want you to go into an upper room. And in, uh, in that upper room, I want you to wait till you're endued with power from on high. And you, shall, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit and boldness will come upon you. And you'll go to, the, to the, all the nations of the world. That's the last time. In the, so where did we get this idea that we have to wait? The moment the Holy Spirit entered the disciples was the last time we were waiting on God to push us forward. Now we need to step out and go. You don't believe me? Read this. Read this. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. I need you to catch this on the screen. Let it sink in right here. Romans chapter 18. 8 verse 19. I'm sorry. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. That means that all the, listen, God's not waiting. God is in the book of Isaiah waiting. It's not that we would get to action, but he's waiting so that he can show out his mercy and his grace on us. But the world is waiting. What is the world waiting for? You and I to be revealed as the church, as the ecclesia, as the sons of God. God is a God. Listen, we're not waiting on God. The world is waiting on us. You see broken, go heal it. You see, you see bad, go bring good. You see hate, bring love. You see racism, bring equality in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. What are what yes, yeah, so what are you waiting? What are you waiting for? 
What are you waiting on? Occupy the streets. Go ye unto all the world and compel men to come. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? I believe that God would rather call a man who he sees doing the wrong thing than he would call a man doing no thing. I would rather God say, hey, this is not... Listen, Paul did this. Paul went to two places in the book of Acts. Paul went to one place... And and the Bible says that there was a shut door. Paul went to another place, and there was a shut door there. Then the Bible says that Paul had a dream. And in his dream, he saw a Macedonian man just standing up, waving his hand, saying, Hey, come over here. Preach the gospel over here. We need hope. And that's what the world is crying out to us. Can you hear it? Can you hear the sound of a broken land crying out for a healed body of Christ? Come out, preach this. No, Paul wasn't caught at home on his couch, Netflix and every show he could find. Paul was out in the streets. Yeah, there were shut doors. Yeah, there was a no. But after all, the no was, hey, over here. This is your purpose. This is your promise. I want to I close with this. Hope. Hope. The hope of a nation. The hope of a nation. You know the reason most people don't hope is this. <laughs> Whew, throw that my way. That was an accident. Symphony, there's a little bit of youth pastor still in me. Sorry. That's youth pastor in me. Sorry. Most people don't hope because they have before. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting. You know another reason people don't hope? Wake up. That's another reason people don't hope. Because they have. And it blew up in their face. Because they have and it blew up in their face. Come over here. I want you. I need all your lungs today. I want you to press. You know, the Bible talks about a story in the Bible, in the book of Acts, that there's a man named Stephen. He's elected to be the apostle. The apostle Stephen. And the Bible says that Stephen is is preaching the gospel. Are we going to go here? I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do this. The harder I die. What did Yoda say? <laughs> Come on. I don't think there is a try. There is no try. You already slobbered it up. You have to do it. <laughs> I can do it. You can do it. That's right. I need you because you're going to ruin my point if you don't. <laughs> You know, there's a story in in the Bible, in the book of Acts. Stephen starts to preach this, this gospel message about Jesus Christ in this city, and they start hating him. That let me see. That's not, that's not big enough. That's not big enough. Let's go. Wait a look. Don't you love Jordan? Come on. We need some power team. Get help him. Now Stephen is preaching this this gospel message and he's preaching Jesus. These people are hating it so much that they're actually plugging their ears. They're plugging their ears to Stephen. Let me see it. It's not big enough. Not big enough. Keep going. And the Bible says that they begin to stone Stephen. And Stephen says this, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. I see Jesus standing at the right. And I know you've heard this. Pastor Matt has said this before. He said, this is the only time in the Bible. That's not big enough. That's the only time in the Bible. That's the only time in the Bible that Jesus is actually standing at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says that, that he, he, gets, he starts getting stoned and people are throwing garments. Just hold on just a second. Just hold on just a second. And, 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 and these people are throwing their garments down at the feet of Saul, this young man named Saul. And then the Bible says that they begin to stone Stephen. And Stephen says this, Lord... 
Lord Jesus, don't lay this to their charge. Don't, don't make this a, a condemnation to them. Don't make this a loss of hope for them. You go to the next chapter, the chapter 8, verse 1, and you hear how the Bible says that, that, that Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. Then we jump to the chapter 9. This great conversion where the Bible says that Saul had the papers in his hand and he was on his way to the road called Damascus and he was on his way to just pillage every Christian home and, and break down every Christian home. And the Bible says there was a light shining out of, the, out of the sky and it shined so bright and he fell off his horse and there was a voice that came from heaven and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul may not have known what he was doing. But I want to go all the way back to chapter 6. Where this unselfish man who could have prayed anything in the last few seconds of his death prayed this prayer. Don't lay this to their charge. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I feel like... I feel like Stephen just broke down the very moment in eternity. Can you see it with me where Saul, after he had just lost his head, walks through the gate of heaven and he makes eye contact with Stephen? I believe that was a cry of a last hope of a dying nation. Don't lay this to his charge. He was there consenting. Kill him. Kill him. Hit him with a stone. And then the awe of seeing that man walk in. And I can see Stephen look at Saul or Paul at the time. I believe Stephen looked at Paul. And then Stephen looked into the eyes of Jesus and said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not big enough. Keep going. I don't know if you heard that yet, but I've been preaching to you for a moment where God is speaking inside of you saying, how big is your hope? How big is your hope? How big is the hope that you have that God can do something? Let me see it. Let me see it. That's, that's not big enough. That church, stand to your feet with me this morning. That's not big enough. No matter how big your dreams are, no matter how big your hopes are, trust me, that's not big enough, Mariah. No matter how big your hopes are for our student ministry, that's not big enough. Worship team, Micaiah, no matter how big your dreams and your hopes are for this worship team, that's not big enough. Pastor Matt, Miss Bobby, no matter how big your dreams are for fellowship of praise, that's not big enough. That's not big enough. Come on, worship team.
have our prayer team up here. Actually, if you want to fill out one of these cards, let your petitions be made known. I, I know that you guys pray over them. The pastoral staff prays over them every Monday. I'll be down here. If you want prayer, we'll, we'll pray with you. I love you. We love you. Thanks for letting us feel like home. Uh, I, I, I feel torn in two places. My heart has been expanded, but I believe it's the outreach of fellowship of prayer, the call of God on Pastor Matt and Miss Bobby reaching out even into Beaver Creek. But hey, also over here, my right, your left, we have communion. If you'd like to just, just have a moment of unity with, with the triune, this is the perfect time with the Trinity, then, then do that. Those of you listening online, thank you for joining us today. You be blessed. I pray that God touches you, keeps you. And may the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, lift his countenance upon you, and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, let this be the best month you've ever had. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you committed your life to Christ today, or you recommitted your life to Christ, fill out an info form at fopchurch.net slash info form so that we can connect with you and be praying for you. Just as a reminder, you can give your tithes and offerings online at fopchurch.net slash give. On our FOP Church app under the giving tab, you can text the amount you want to give to 937-400-1779 or you can mail a check made out to FOP Church to P.O. Box 381, Clarksville, Ohio 45113. Thanks for joining us this morning and have an awesome week.